But if you do a job which nobody wants to do, it's going to pay higher. But at the same time, a skill which is required in every community, let's say, you're not going to be out of work. How I look at my trade now is to say that, look, every house has a tap, has a washing machine, have a bath, has a shower. One day, one of them things is going to break. Guess what? I'll call you. I'll be at your door. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we started the show without even knowing we started the show. Please, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome to the show. I don't know what. Let's call him a superhero plumber, right? I say that to say this. When you think of plumbing, you think of. I don't want to be rude, but you, you know, it doesn't seem like a cool job. You know, you think, oh, you're going to come in, fix that, fix that. You've got dirty clothes on. After that, you go on. You don't even think of plumbers that got their own houses, well-maintained, living a good life. We just see them as important, but once they go, we don't. We never think of plumbers unless we need them. However, my next guest is not just a plumber. He's a model. He's a teacher. He's an influencer. He's a superhero plumber. If you ever wondered how cool plumbing can be, you just need to look up Mr. Landon Plowman. Sir Jay. Thank you, man. Thank you for the introduction. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. To the very, very beginning, and then we'll go back and forth as as we see fit. Mm -hmm. What made you get into plumbing? So my first experience of plumbing is seeing my uncle. My uncle is a second generation Jamaican man, come to England and um, he studied to do plumbing. And I always used to see him with tools in my six weeks holiday when I was about 13, 14. My uncle's got tools, he's going out doing jobs. It looks cool, I'm not gonna lie. You know, when you're young and you have a bike, you wanna fix your bike, guess what? Let me borrow this spanner, make sure you put the spanner back. If you don't put the spanner back, it's big talks happening to you. So from then I started saying, hmm, I like fixing stuff, you know? I like doing stuff with my hands. How old are you at this age? I was about 13, 14 this time, yeah. So I was always around my uncle previously because um, my uncle uh, is a big part of my life. And, um, you know, I used to do judo, so I was always at his house, but he would go off to do plumbing jobs and come back and everything's all right. And I'm saying, oh, okay, what, you just went, what did you do and all that? Like a bit questionable. I was quick. I was curious about it, innit, at the time, innit? I was like, oh, so what can you bring me and all that? And you know, like it seemed like oh, it was quite something, quite fun to do whatever he was doing. You know, he was coming back a little bit dirty, a couple of things with him. He'd help him carry something out of the car. So I thought, yeah, I, I, I want to try that. And an opportunity, well, it was, it's, it's definitely an opportunity now when I look at it, which is, um, when I was 15, I was going to Barbados because that's where my family are from. I was going on a family holiday, all my cousins. And my passport was out of date. So um, we're standing in the queue. Don't start laughing. We're standing in the queue. And um, I've At looked... Heathrow Airport. Yeah, yeah. I've looked around and uh, everyone's going through, like all my cousins, everyone's, yeah. My passport, the lady's saying, hold on, wait there. So I'm saying, hold on. I'm looking at my mum and my mum's like, what, what's, what's up? So everyone's kind of ushered through. My passport's out of date. My uncle's dropped us there, the same one who's a plumber. Long story short, I've had to go back to my uncle. While I'm getting my passport, everybody will know, you know, like when you, you had to go like Petit France and stuff yeah. like that, it takes a little bit of a process. And then people got to start asking, well, why is this man taking you here and not your parents? So it was all, it ended up being a couple of more days than what it had to be off of the holiday, but, so everyone's gone. Yeah. Let's just briefly touch on that as a kid. Yeah. Everyone's gone on a plane. Yeah. And then you had to go back. What was that feeling like? Because you're 15. At this time, I'm quite comfortable with being on my own because I had been uh, training and doing judo since I was 10, 11. So by the time 
10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I've been going away to the British squad for weekends for a long time. So being away from my parents, it, it wasn't a struggle, I think. I just realised I was coming to the end of school, so I had to find something to do in life. Like, judo was, it's not a professional sport, is it? But being at, the, at a high level from a young age, unless I was born in France where judo is a national sport and everybody does judo in school, that's why it's so big in France. But in England, football, rugby, basketball, not basketball, um, cricket, cricket is our national sports. So judo is kind of, it's, you know, you, when people think of judo, they probably think of Mr. Bruce Lee. It's nothing like that. Yeah. It's not happening. People it's not are, that fancy. It's not that fancy. Yeah. Well, even people are going down, but it's not that yeah, fancy. It's, but it's, um, it definitely taught me some um, independence, you know. So at that point, I knew that either I had to get along with life and just figure out a plan, just like I would have to figure out a plan if I was fighting someone for the first time. I'm going to figure out a plan how to get you on the floor. And if we have to strangle you out, that's what we've got to do. So, so at this time then, that's okay. You and uncle spend a few days together. Yeah. So that's where their inquisitiveness grew bigger. Well, I'm from a Caribbean background, so there's the understanding of that. If I'm going to work, you can't be staying in the house. So and it's summer holidays. It's summer holidays as well. And I'm of age as well. So therefore, there's, you can't be lounging about, do you know what I mean? So And you wanted to because you've always seen him come back. Yeah. So it's cool. It, it was definitely a, a, a curiosity thing because I thought to myself, so what do you do, man? Because yeah. I know you as my uncle, isn't it? I don't know you as Mr. Plumber or this guy who's a plumber to somebody else. You're my uncle. You've been my uncle since I've been a child. So I just know you as my uncle Llewellyn. That's my uncle's name. So... To see some of the other things that I'm saying, oh, what, my uncle done that? Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. And just like, um, just navigating and just being a part of it, I realised at that point, do you know what? This is something I can actually do, you know? I enjoy this. And um, having him as a teacher, he had been a lecturer at the time. So I thought to myself, you know what? There's nobody who has taught me better lessons in judo and taught me some discipline than my uncle. He never guided me in a way which wasn't, the way of like his own son, he treats me like his own son. I always have to say that because that's what my uncle was like to me. He's like a second dad. That's how it should be. Yeah, of course. That's what uncles out there, you half-time, part-time uncles, you need to step up your game, sorry. <laughs> so I, I feel that it's like, we, I grew this bond for him and the understanding that, it's my uncle, I don't, go, I don't want to let him down, innit, as a person, innit? And I respect him, he's brought me to all these competitions, he's helped me become national medals, win... I don't know, we're going to get into that. Yeah. Now we're going to get but, to But he's helped me through that through those stages, so I definitely feel that he would never line me up for an accomplishment or a challenge which I wasn't able to do. He saw it in me, innit? And I think that when some people see some things in you from a young age, whether it's the ability to be able to conduct yourself, whether it's the ability to be able to do a task, um, they see it in you. And that whole point of seeing it in you just gives you that extra drive to just keep on going. And it's someone who I can always fall back to for information, you know, and, and I, I'm so luckily to have that person to hand like that because that's like been, that's been a mentor for me because some of the achievements, what he's done, like he has a master's in plumbing. I don't have a master's in plumbing. I would love to. But, it's not um, too late. No, it's definitely not too late. But I do think that, like, um, for for me seeing him, I've said to myself, do you know what? The legacy, what he's set, I'm going to double that. Wow. I'm going to triple it. i tell you what's so beautiful, the way you're paying homage to him, the gratitude, because a lot of us don't have such role models. Mm. And for some of us who do we still don't appreciate them like they should. And the fact that you said, you don't want to let him down. Do you know that's what? That's amazing. I feel the, look, when someone shows you love, yeah, genuine love, like, you can only show love back. You know, it's, it, it's, hard, it's harder to show love back than it is to hate somebody for a particular reason why you don't know why. Like, I have no, like, 
if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be a plumber today. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't live the life I do live now. And you love being a plumber. Yeah, I, I, do you know what? At a point, I liked it, yeah. But now I love it because I can choose to do what I want. And I feel that having this level of freedom, you know, like when some people think about a plumber, yeah, they think about a toilet. Think about a guy with his butt crack hanging out. <laughs> well, you that's got what I wanted to say in the intro. I know, that's plumber. fine. That's fine. Because you know what it is? A lot of plumbers who are like myself, at the end of the day, the image is an image which you paint, which you choose to conduct or uphold. That's up to you. But I feel that the... Right, that whole scenario of taking a toilet off the wall, yeah? I'm going to break it down for you. So to take a toilet off the wall on a basic price is three hundred pounds. I'm just sure just to take it, just to take it off. That's what a normal company charges who are out there right now. I don't want to say their name because I don't want to give them any publicity. But that's the normal basic guy rate. Just to take it, just nothing take it else. Off the wall. Just take it off the wall because it's sewage what you're dealing with now, isn't it? So you're, you what you deal with is is a, how long. Mm-hmm. Sorry to cut you off. How long does it take to take that toilet off? It could, well, it's got two screws hanging it in, depends on what type of toilet it is. And it's got two screws at the bottom. So how quick can you take two screws off and pull it forward? So at the, <coughs> the slowest plumber, mm. no more than 10 minutes. No, look, when I say no more than 10 minutes, it, it, there's always a routine on how you like to do something here. Yeah? Because if you was to pull the toilet straight off the wall, you're, you're gonna get something like the water what sits in the bottom. And that water what sits in the bottom is sitting in something what's called a trap. So that trap seals the smell of the waste what you can smell when you, when you look down the stack. So you wanna obviously put something in place. I would say for myself or an average person, no longer than like 25 minutes, you'd be able to take off the wall. What's the what's the uh, Rasta look out for? What's the average um pay in in the UK in twenty twenty two? Please look up when you're ready. No hourly. I would say the hourly rate is probably going to be about seventy to eighty pounds an hour. No, I'm talking about just just natural national average pay. Oh, the in, national average yeah, pay in in the UK. I think it's not no more than ten pounds. I believe right. Uh, the what the minimum wage? Yeah, like minimum, wage, minimum yeah. wage. Yeah. So yeah. while Rasta's looking that up. 25 minutes. Yeah. Quicker than that. Nah. Let's just be kind. Yeah. yeah. Let's even be more kind. Half an hour mm-hmm. to take down the toilet, 300 pounds. Yeah. That is good money. It is good money. And this is, this is what I think when people look at the cliche and they understand the fundamentals behind it, it's a whole different story. I worked, when I was an apprentice, I worked with a guy called Mick the Ship. And his Mick? nickname was Mick the Shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because like he used that. to do drainage, innit? Yeah. So everyone used to joke about him, like Mick's always touching shit and blah, 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 yeah? But Mick was the first guy that I knew who had a Ferrari. He lived in a six bedroom house with a swimming pool. Who people do, see, that's the power of leaving the materialistic stuff. Because people want that job that looks good. But if you do a job which nobody wants to do, it's going to pay higher. But at the same time, a skill which is required in every community, let's say, you're not going to be out of work. How I look at my trade now is to say that, look, every house has a tap, has a washing machine, have a bath, has a shower. One day, one of them things is going to break. Guess what? I'll be at your door. And it sounds like an advert there. No, 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 it's not. Because it's not, like, <laughs> you, you, you know about adverts. We can, we can, I do, we can, but... We can produce that. But what I'm saying is that at the end of the day, when you've got a service, yeah, which you know that a lot of people need, but you also show value within your service because you're obviously showing people the reason why you should maintain something. If you buy a tap for £100 five years ago, you're going to say that that tap's... Uh, it's lasted you, it's cost you £20 every year. And if it the gives up rate, yes. after that and you don't spend nothing into it, like you didn't buy a £5 washer to fit inside it just to replace the seal or something, 
you not spending that five pounds now it's gonna cost you another five hundred in the long run. But when we don't think of these little things. But I think some of the uh, upkeep of like general aesthetics in houses and stuff like that, yeah. When I worked in big buildings, I've worked for Amazon, I've worked for a lot of high up companies. And um, when something's not yours, you're going to break it easily. Yeah. yeah, that's just how it goes. When you're in your home, you tend to take time with your shower. You tend to, you, so someone might take the shower head off and descale it themselves because they realize the scale is building up. And then that might make someone look into something like a video, what I've done about lime scale. Mm -hmm. So therefore they're saying, oh, maybe we need to, you know, get into a routine of doing this. And that way the bathroom stays a bit nicer. Mm -hmm. Oh, where did you get the idea from? I've got the idea from this person. And so I feel that adding that value to somebody who is a normal household person who owns a home first time, first time moved out, just living with friends, just want to make sure things are a bit more nicer in their home. They're going to take heed to those ideas and say to themselves, do you know what? I'm going to start doing that or that's something that I can do. I've watched this and now I can do it. So therefore the value is in your knowledge and what you know and pick up just things what you can pass off to customers because I feel that it's, that's the reason they're going to use me as a plumbing service instead of somebody else who which is just giving a generic service which is not going to give much value. Did you find... Did we find 15, 15 pounds, six? So the, the average, the minimum wage mm. at the moment, depending on the age, is 15 pounds, six pence. Average, sorry. Yeah. So let's go average. And as a plumber, 300 pounds to take off a toilet, which if we're being kind, it's going to take half an hour. Yeah. That's just being kind. 300 divided by, so we're looking at, 50 pounds? Mm. Give or take. Got to add a bit of tax in it. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Let's just say 50 pounds. Yeah. But you are making 300 pounds in less than less than an hour. Mm -hmm. Why is plumbing not respected or why do a lot of people want to go into that trade? One, it's a skilled trade, yeah? So therefore, not everybody makes it through it because... Um, you have to have a level of GCSEs, isn't it? Like it's four GCSEs to be able to get onto a plumbing course. But the thing about it now is just that plumbing courses have been made, instead of having a two years, it's now five years. So now, even if you did think you're not gonna see that plumber again, guess what you will? So everyone better get used to my face because I've had my qualifications for years. So therefore, <laughs> you had them when it was two years. I'm available. But, but and, and not only that, um, even though some people say, oh, you only had two years, five years is better. You've had experience on a job. Yeah, I think, um, look, London is a city which is built upon a city, which is built upon a city, which is built upon a city. It's always a city. Exactly. Was, we, I, I remember working um, at Somerset House and them doing construction work, which was downstairs for the library. Yeah. And they actually found a mansion underneath Somerset House with some of the oldest Victorian toilets inside it. Really? And they didn't even know it was there. Rah! So that's what- That I'm must have been a gold mine for plumbers. Definitely, because it's something which is gonna be historical it's definitely going to be something which is going to be legendary towards this country yeah. but um it's how it's evolved in it you've got to understand like we've got a lot of properties in west london and they've built townhouses they've built some of the structures of the buildings are being modified they're being stretched out they're being pulled out people want people want an outhouse they want a toilet in their outhouse they want to shower upstairs on the full floor They've got, they've made a fifth floor. Now all of a sudden they, they want a bathroom up there. They wonder why the water can't come out as quick as it can downstairs. Simple little things which you can um, organize and design if you know how to. Yeah. But it's coming into all these different environments, including the new builds which are out there, which are, they're cheaply put together. I'm not gonna lie to you. Oh yeah, you could tell, people could tell. I mean, you can just hear through. 
I don't think there's anyone out there in, in London mm. that lives in a new build and they're actually satisfied with the level of quality of the houses. Everyone I speak to, it's like a box. It's, there's always some level of complaint. I go to customers all over London. And my most recent one was I was at um, some new uh, apartments. Well, they're not apartments, they're just like houses in Kensal Rise. And um, I know they paid well in the millions for the, them houses. And uh, some of the telltale problems were just like basic plumbing things. I'm like, if you've paid over half a million pounds for a house, do you expect to go into the bathroom and when you run the toilet, you hear gargling at your sink? Wouldn't you just be, you'd just be like, why is this happening? <laughs> you, you would. Just, yeah. But at, at, at the end of the day, I think there's so much with when it comes to construction and building works, there's so many programs on now, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody sits down and they say, oh, I want a bathroom like that. Oh, I want to I wanna convert the house like that. But what goes into it, you have to take some type of, um, some type of notes. You have to understand what you're getting yourself into, whether it's a small or a big project. When people cut corners, they don't get results. But at the same time, people want results for some of the cheapest money. Like now as a plumber, I see a lot of um, handymen and DIY guys. I pick up on some of the jobs what they do, what they mess up on. I don't have yes. a problem with that because it always creates more work. Yeah. Workflow is workflow. But it's trying to get across why they've used someone who is going to be way cheaper with no qualifications instead of someone who's going to be more expensive with qualifications where you're not going to have the comebacks. I think it's the price thing at the end of the day. Because I think, again, when people hear, like, for example, if I, if I hear, if I called up someone to come change my, my toilet mm -hmm. and they tell me £300, yeah. I'm just going to think, mm, just, just to change the toilet. Mm. Let me see if I can get it cheaper. Yeah. We're not actually, because we're just hearing the price. We're not realising the value. As you said, I'm going to call someone, going to come, what, let's say £50 or £100, pounds, whatever. I'm like, yes, I'm spending, I'm saving £200. Pounds. There's a reason. Because once that person, the minute that person leaves, half an hour later, something is going to go wrong with that. Then, only then, I'm going to come to you. Mm. So I think you're right. People should really look at it. You are not paying... Um, for for the for the showmanship of it, or paying for a professional person who's got qualification, knows what they're doing, reliable, and they will only come back once. Yeah, I think that um, having good customer relationship and transparency when you talk to customers and being able to like put it this way, I always say to customers when I go to the house, I'm like, look, I'm going to show you it. It's broken now, yeah. I'm going to show you when I fix it. So you can see how it works. So there's no gray areas. You can't say when I've left here that it wasn't working. And as well, I, I film content. So therefore, you know, like I can explain to people what happened or what we've done. And that obviously assures people this guy knows what he's talking about. And your reputation's on the line. Yeah, most definitely. But I, I feel that you're always relying on your skill at the end of the day. The skill on how you know how to fix it will always get you through it. It's not going to be your, like, my rep or my thing, because yeah. things happen, you know? Like, I could go to a shop and get a fitting and the fitting be 40 because it doesn't have the British kite mark on it. So a British kite mark is the testing of British standards so that it looks like a little heart on an envelope and it's just, it's just like that and it's got like a line in between it. Yes. Yeah, so that means that it's British standards. Uh -huh. But we get many of different... All over the place. We get them from all over the place. and Outside if you, the UK. <laughs> if you've done a job, basically. Like, I, I, I've worked with someone who had a, that done a job and um, we needed public liability insurance. So insurance, so you're working in demolition insurance because um, he's been instructed to do something. But there are two different clauses, you know what I mean? <clears throat> But um, basically, he'd done a job. The customer said, our house is flooded now, 85000 His insurance has got a covering for that. The insurance will go back and say, where did you get the parts from? Do you get what I mean? Now it creates a whole story. At the end of the day, someone wants to be paid out. That's it. Yeah. 
So it's going to make your insurance go up and it's going to make you not be an insurable person, just like your car insurance. So there is obviously side effects to it. So I definitely feel that going through someone who is professional, has that level of insurance and has and makes you feel comfortable as a customer. You know, like people have asked me for references before and stuff like that, which I don't have a problem with doing. But, you know, if you're going to go through all those hurdles, believe me, the price is going to be hefty. He said it. I didn't say it. He said it, ladies it, and gentlemen. It, I, I think it has to be. But I look, when you, you've you, yeah. put two years in. This mm. is something you've been doing since you had the interest since you was 13. Yeah. When on your first job at the age of 15. I am paying for the years that you put in, and I think rightly so you deserve, because you got a living. You got mm -hmm. bills to pay. You, you, you... It's not cheap. Yeah. So why should you make it cheaper for everything else? Like It's like when you go to a club and then you buy one shot and then the bartender tells you £25 for that shot. You don't start trying to negotiate. You pay. Because roughly, I would say, look, to get public liability insurance for a plumber for a year, and this is like no soldering, so that means that you're not using a heat gun. Yeah. So that is £50 a month, and that only brings you up to a million pounds. Most houses, what you're going to go into, you're going to need like 10, 15. I'm going into some houses in Belgrave and stuff like that. It's 65. You can imagine I'm paying like, they like 200 pounds, 300 pounds a month. And this isn't a phone. This isn't just for insurance. But at the same time, it could be worth it because now you can do insurance jobs. You can, you can open yourself into a whole new field when it comes to what you're doing as a professional. You know, and I feel that you you open some doors for yourself because plumbing has so many different branch offs like i do insurance jobs i'll do installation jobs i'll do maintenance as well and then now i've started i thought to myself i always need to keep on pulling out more services to be able to increase what i'm doing so i can get a bigger audience so now i'm doing virtual consultations so basically everybody has a phone guess what, they found you from your phone, probably. So they found you through Instagram, found you through YouTube, whatever they use to find you. So now, if you use your phone and you say, do you know what, I've got a leak underneath my sink, an average plumber call out is gonna be 80 to 150, sometimes 200. Do you know what, talking about using your phone, your, your phone game, your Instagram content creation game, it's off the chart. Thank you. It, it's crazy because what really, I'm like, sometimes like, we film every day, we yes. do this. Sometimes I struggle for what to put out. I'm thinking, oh. and then whenever you come up on my feed, or whenever I go, I'm like, he, did he just make content out of that? L let me go, let me, like, you an inspiration, like you make content. He just, he just cleaned a spanner. He and, and his content. Mm. Mm. So I've got loads. Let me. So, I mean, it's crazy. And let's touch on that. How important or how much has social media helped you to get out there as a plumber? Um, it's catapult, catapulted into a next league because I first started off doing social media. And I, I was sit, first of all, I was sitting in a car with my friend at work. And I said, you know what? It's cool me working for these other people, but I ain't getting anywhere in life. And for the time being, I need to be at work because I'm a plumber, but I'm mechanically biased. So my first trade is plumbing, but I can do other trades like heating and ventilation. And I've got some electrical qualifications as well. So therefore they class you as something which is called multi-trade. So that's two trades in one. So two trades in one means that I need to pay you two wages. That's how it should be, but not all the time. But instead of getting, let's say like the average plumber is getting 35,000, as a mechanically biased engineer, you're getting 46,000. That's where you're starting. At a time, people are getting 50, 56. So it's a good basic. Mm. So once you've got that basic, you're working inside that environment. So the environment which I used to work in is mainly um, a commercial environments, so hospitals, colleges, universities, those types of environments. But loads of people ain't seeing me that and saying that I'm a plumber, but I am a plumber by trade. 
So now I've decided, okay, how am I going to see loads of people? In 2017, 2016, Instagram was kind of like, it was, it was, it was there, but people wasn't really on it because they didn't really know what it was. It was a photo app, innit? Mm. So I thought, let me start taking some photos of what I'm doing and seeing if people are interested. And then I found a guy online who was doing exactly what I wanted to do, but he's from America. So I had to change what he was doing and be able to do it in my own way. That created Mr. London Plumber. I thought about the name when I was in the car in Archway on my break. And I said, nah, I'm going to be Mr. London Plumber because I'm, lo I'm from London. My name is my name, but I don't want people to call me my name. Mm. So you need this alias to create this buzz about you. So once I got something that was catchy, Mr. London Plumber, my cousin is a graphics designer. Mm. So he made the London skyline with my logo in it. And it made so much sense because you see the London skyline, you see London Plumber. So it made, and no one had bought the name, which I was really surprised about. But once I got that, it was a wrap. And then I started putting up videos of, I used to work in a pair with someone else. Mm. So he's an Italian guy. And it was just a nice mix, you know, black guy, Italian guy. We're just, we're young guys, we're driving from sites and we're just catching jokes. Yeah. Catching jokes, we're going to the calf, we're doing just what people do in construction, but without not much people seeing. And also, we're also putting together bathrooms for flats what are like where the BBC is now. So where the old BBC is in Shepherd's Bush, yeah. we've done all those flats. Those flats start at like 1.5 million, 2, 2 million, but we're doing all the flats and we've got all the content of us doing it, like messing around inside there while people are going to live and they're going to be ex yeah. expensive homes. But <laughs> we've done the content there already. So it's created a bond and then people started watching it, a couple thousand views every other day. And I'm saying, nah, people like this, you know, David. And this is the guy I was working with. And he's like, we should do more of it. So I continue to do more of it, then put music with it because I used to DJ when I was 14. Jesus. So I used to, I used to warm up for EZ when I was 14 years wow. old. But that's just like a whole different like part of my life. So I love music. And I thought, let me put the music and the content together. But... I understood that people actually really going to see the real value in what I'm doing when I narrate it, when I talk. Yes. But again, like most people, they don't like the sound of their voice. Mm. I didn't until a lot of women told me my voice sounds <laughs> serious. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just keep that one, yeah? Mr. London Plumber goes <laughs> up to <laughs> Let's leave that alone. <laughs> How much? Your voice sounds like... Come on, let's come work for us. <laughs> but I feel that, that that whole point of it, um, being able to narrate the content which I do provide for people, but also it doubling up as an advert for what I'm doing, because you have to understand at the time, um, Pimlico Plumbers and companies like that are the biggest companies. Yeah. But let's just keep it real. And I've said it to them, and because I've taught their students before. And I said, look, at a time when I'm doing plumbing, you don't employ black people, so... Me working for you and all that's not going to happen. Back in the day, I did send my CV, but I got some sense. Mm. And I realised there's no one like me there. So why would I want to be there? I'm not going to be able to progress. It's going to be a point of where I'm going to hit the point, which is earning money. But I can earn money for myself anyway, because there was a point in my life. And, and it was at that particular workplace where I made the name Mr. London Plumber is when somebody called me and I was sitting back. Someone goes to me. Jay, do you know what? I pay you, I pay you 110 grand. I for the name? Huh? For the no, name? No, no, no. For me to work for them. Okay. And I was on about like 40s them times. I had to leave the workplace to receive this phone call. You know, you have to walk outside yes. sometimes. Someone, someone tells you something. Yeah. What, what's going to touch your soul? Yeah. Just walk outside for a minute. Just touch the earth for a minute and just take in the vibrations, in it? Because at this point, I didn't know it now, but I know it now, which is somebody's telling you you're worth, worth it. You're worth it. So I'm like, whoa, why am I still here around these, man? I'm, I need to, Go on. I need to keep moving. I need to make a plan. Yeah. But there's no point in, there's no point making an exit if you don't have a plan. And this whole plan needs to have some type of structure. It needs to have some type of base and it needs to have a community because when you build your own ecosystem, you don't need to rely on other people's. And that's what it's all about, is building your own ecosystem. Like my 
social network now feeds loads of different people. But when I meet people, I make sure that they have this interaction with me. So they have this relationship with me now. All my customers can call me and say, you know, like, oh, someone down the road, Jay, they, they need a plumber. The I've female ones, I bet you get through more attention than the males. <laughs> Do you know what it is? You, I think, I think the, the, the gelling with people, I got that from my earlier days of customer service when my sister gave me my first job. And my Which sister, was? who put me on as a... So I used to, when I first came out of school, I'd done, I worked in an opticians okay. with my sister. So my sister put me on from that. And that's where I got my first... Do you know what? If there's one thing I can, I can, I can advise people, mm. you testify to this, bigger than anything else, in any given company, or if you're working for yourself, customer service. Yeah, and I, that, I, I would always say I thank my sister for that because I don't big my sister up enough. My sister is my biggest supporter. Amazing. Day in, day out. I won't lie to you. The first time I ever have something to do, the first time I ever want to do a GoFundMe or anything, my sister's the first person to support me. Amazing. And anything my sister wants to do, like I'd rather my sister manage me than me get someone else to manage me. Do you get it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, so my sister helped me get this customer service, um, well, this job uh, in the opticians, and she's the manager. And me just working with people and actually serving people I had to create this level of like, oh, how can I help you, blah, 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 blah. And then end in a sale and then not feeling a way to be able to tell someone the price. Close that sale. Yeah. That's one of the hardest things for most salespeople, closing the sale. Like they would do everything, but they just, they don't want to close it. But before, before I even started that, when I was 15, obviously through my sister, again, she worked there for a couple of years, I used to sell contact lenses when I was in school. And that's when I made my first thousand pound when I was in school, you know. I used to have like about three or four girls working for me. Don't, they don't work for me now, but when we used to work together, you know you used to have your little hustle when you're in Guys, school. Guys, when he says girls working for him in, they were selling contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I hope that's what you yeah, meant. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, contact <laughs> Not lenses. Not that kind of work. Contact lenses. He was 15. <laughs> <laughs> contact lenses, and it was through like a network of girls who were I was always cool with, and um, it ended up being like, five or six girls in the end for different schools and I'll just like meet them and just like give them the back we'd all make money in it at yeah. the end of the day and I think that and me understanding how to make money in my own community while keeping everyone kind of happy but still maintaining enough to keep myself happy that was like my first spell of like business that's when I realized you know what you to be the boss you got to do this this and this and if you're not willing to do it you're not going to be that person and if you tell your links or you tell your source where you actually do get everything from, if you tell it to everybody else, people have got no use for you. Yeah. You, have to create, uh, you have to create value for yourself. They have to come back. So plumber, customer service, you're touched into judo. You, 20, 2012. Yeah. You was the torchbearer mm -hmm. in London. Talk to us about that. So I had an interview. Um, I had a call up from someone. I had been on the BBC before that for yeah. judo and stuff like that with my cousin, Julian Kerr. That's the person Julian. who made yeah. my graphics design for my logo. He's actually crazy at making logos. But um, me and him, you, you, we've been on BBC before and they asked me to do it. And I was just like, uh, yeah. Uh, the interviewer guy was Steve Cram. So... Um, I didn't know what I was going to do originally when I got there. They were like, oh, Jason, we just want to talk to you. I just want to blah, blah, blah. I'm like, cool. I'll just turn up in normal clothes or something, can it? They're like, no, no, wear your Great Britain tracksuit and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, what's going to go on? I was like, listen, there are going to be a few people there and we're going to give you the torch to run and you're going to run it up to the town hall and you're going to pass it over to someone. I'm like, what, me? And they're like, yeah, you. And I'm like, oh, okay. So it was kind of a surreal moment because you know like there's I would say there's about three or four hundred people there 
someone's giving you the torch, you're running. The first thing I was hoping is I don't buckle oh, on it. <laughs> if I buckle, it's over. It's over. That will end up on the internet forever. You'll be a meme for the a, rest of your life. Rest of my life. The London plumber who on dropped the, floor, the torch. Yeah. <laughs> the torches went out in London. It'll be something like that, innit? So um, for me, it was just like, it was a moment of like, wow, like um, the Olympics is a big thing. You know, like I've always watched the Olympics. I admire anyone who's a sportsman that gets themselves to that level because that level is elite, elite level, you know. So um, I always look back and say to myself that it's a massive achievement because, you know, for the Olympics to be here, like when it was in Stratford and being some part of that, that's amazing. It's, it's just like... It's kind of surreal, but I just have to pinch myself sometimes and remind myself I was there. Do you get it? Like, they, it was you they was filming. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't anybody else. It was you. But I think that it's just, it's a, it's a moment in life. And it's definitely a moment in life where I will tell my kids about them when I'd have them. And just something to pass on because to myself, I feel that it's something I've done. But to others, it's, it's, a, it's a massive achievement. But... I realise it is an achievement to me. Right? It's just some things I just don't talk about so much because I'm not living that life right this second. Well, you lived it. I mean, you, uh, how far did you take your judo career? So um, I'd done judo from the age of like seven till the age of like 22. So I was in the British squad from when I was about 10 years old. So I started to go to Europe. I started to go... I went to... I went to Holland over, in my life now, I've probably been to Holland over 4,000 times. Like, I mean, there was a lot of competitions over there. So over the span of like 15, 16 years, I'd been there quite a lot. Um, France as well, because judo is a national sport there. Um, I've been to Hungary, went to the Europeans there when I was 17. Um, I didn't go to the Youth Olympics. I wish I did go to the Youth Olympics, but within sport, when you get to a certain level, there is a lot of politics in it. So people want you to do. And I wasn't a person to do. Like, I'm going to be a person how I am. I'm going to do what I want to do at a period of time. And um, <clears throat> judo is a single man sport. So I thought sometimes by doing all the training camps, sometimes which you would do after A tournaments and stuff like that, You'd be training with the people that you beat. It's a single person sport. I don't need him to know how he could beat me, not today. So I'm gonna sit this one off or I'm not gonna train because it's pointless. I've beaten you already. So going back in the room with you is only gonna give you encouragement to try and beat me. So we're not gonna do that. I'm gonna sit this one out and I'm gonna kindly remove myself at this point, which obviously people didn't like at the point, but your method on how you choose to stay on top is your method, you know? If I was Floyd Mayweather and I chose to fight people when I felt like it and I beat them, there's nothing to say, yeah. you know, but that allows my legacy to carry on and to have an unbeaten record for like 17 years within judo. I hadn't lost in this country like in that amount of time. So I feel that it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely an achievement for it myself. It definitely is for anyone in, in I, any given sport at that level. But I feel that like... Um, the level of competitiveness at that level is very intense. And my parents supported me through all of it, you know, and they're not parents, which I did, my dad's not the type of guy to be honest, go on, go on. It's not that type of, because as I've got older, he's under, we've sat down and had conversations and he said, you know, if I was that type of person, you would have felt so much pressure. Mm. And I don't know if you'd have been able to do what you would, because you're, cause you're thinking about letting me down. It's not about that. I'm not fighting out there. You're fighting. And you don't like to be told what to do anyway. Yeah, but for my parents, it's totally different. Yeah, but it's still, you know, like, it becomes a headache. Well, I think it becomes more of a stress because yeah. on the sideline, when you see parents who are involved in competitive sports and sports which are high contact, where if someone's going to get hurt at some point, mm. the parents are going nuts. Yeah. They're, the mums are going crazy. The sandwiches are flying. The apples... <laughs> They're trying to do something to you. Baby, yeah. don't do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I feel that there's, there's super passion behind it. My mum used to be really passionate behind it, but I feel that, like, it was stressful, but at the same time, super rewarding as well. You know, like, when I see my mum 
I give my mum my medals uh, uh, and it's just something for her to speak about with her friends, you know, like, do you know that, you know Jason's number seven in the world, isn't it? Or you know, like, he's this number in the world, isn't it? Uh, that's my son, isn't it? And so I, I, I really do get it because, you know, like I've met people who my dad's worked with and they're like, oh, he speaks about your judo all the time, you know, he told me that he had... Proud. Yeah, like, that's a good feeling. Of course. Now when I get older, I really understand it. But when I'm younger, I'm just thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to do another competition. I don't know if I can yeah. be bothered. But my mum's... I come from a Caribbean home, innit? My mum's on this. Don't waste my money, innit? Yeah. Or don't waste my time. We're not coming to all these training sessions and you're not going to compete. Which I'm happy that they put me through that because it gave me the consistency to stay in what I'm doing now today. Consistency. Without that, I don't think that I would have been so consistent and, you know, like picking up on different things. Judo gave me, when I used to do judo, I used, we used to do lines, we used to do line dancing. So why would you do okay. line dancing? To, to know where your feet are without not being able to look down. So you can, you're a dancer then? I do the bogle with the girls, but I'm not, I know, because you're making it sound like a... <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to call Mr. London Plumber, make sure your wife is not at home by herself. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. No, but I think the coordination to do with your, to do with your feet and to do with your hands is very yeah. important in life. And, you know, like, when you get that balance and yeah. you're able to see where your hands are without your feet, you're able to be quite a dangerous person. And it's second nature. That's one of less course. concentration you yeah. have to worry about. Like, I, 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 I work, I trained, I got my black belt at the oldest judo club in London, which is called the Budokai Judo Club. So it's the oldest judo club in London. Where is what? What part of London it's is in that? Fulham and Chelsea. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's really West nice, London. established place. Oldest um, dojo, that's what judo clubs are called in London. So it's very prestige to get a black belt from there. And I managed to do that and being a Londoner and being a London plumber. So it just, for me, it kind of like certain things made history or sealed the deal for who I was going to be before. Mm. So it, it, it was all just an, a build up to like, you know, some of the achievements, what you can do. And I yes. think that like um, achieving some of them things from a young age, being in, I think I was in newspapers from when I was like 12. So newspaper from your 12, how many adverts have you featured in? I've featured in six plumbing six adverts, adverts. Yeah. Uh, worked with the likes of BBC, for the BBC on their houses, worked for Amazon. You've got all this going, amazing content creator. I definitely wouldn't mess with you if you messed up my toilet <laughs> in the house because you'd probably wrap me up in a headlock <laughs> and just leave me in there. <laughs> so yeah, how much you want? 300? It's yours, you know? <laughs> Um, what is it like? I'm not, you know, it's actually been sometimes I feel sad when I ask this question to mm. people in the field, but it's one we can't avoid. Yeah. What is it like being a black person as a plumber in London? Well, I would definitely say being a tradesperson, nobody sees colour. And I say nobody sees colour is, is just that I haven't had any issues with any customers or people where we've had to do that at the door or something or like oh my god you're the black plumber i've not had that to be yeah. honest people know that you're coming for a service and i feel that maybe now that i'm more representative of myself and my company it's a lot different mm. but you i've had had i've had the the experience of being on a, a site where someone said oh jason you know jermaine don't you because he's from south london but he's black, basically. But that's to do with people's humour or maybe what you, they might consider as a joke or consider appropriate to say to you. But from time you're a big man and from time you're acting professional, you should know that that conduct is not acceptable, period. So you would stamp that out. But I feel that um, people do go through it and people put themselves down because it's not an industry which is dominated by us. And that industry not being dominated by us, we have to have some type of presence. And I feel that I have an obligation to have some type of presence because I've made enough impact, but at the same time, I've learnt lessons to know that I'm a representation of myself and not everybody else. But 
this is a benchmark which I do definitely do want to set for other people because I know that plumbers who I've taught who are black are now going to go into the world saying that do you know what I've been taught by a black man he's taught me certain principles and he's let me understand that if he grew up with the understanding that I have to work twice as hard or three times as hard because I am black which people want to take with a pinch of salt, you can take it how you want, but it's there. But if I work three times as hard, I'm going to be better than everybody. My, my mission is to be better than everybody. It's not to be the average, because the average isn't going to get me anywhere. The average house price, half a million pounds. I need to be above the average to be getting above the average money, to be able to be getting above the average life that you deserve. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I feel that, look, we're going to go places where we're going to be a minority and we're going to go places where we're going to be the majority. Mm. Do you get it? Like, I go to the Caribbean and obviously a lot of people are black. So therefore, a lot of trace people. But above them, them, all the people running the jobs, they're white. Yep, yep. I, I, I would like, before we move on, I would like, for you to share the story about the real McCoy that you shared off camera, mm -hmm. please, because I thought that was interesting and I never knew that. So I've always been interested in history when it comes to black people and what we have contributed towards society, um, life. So I always try and bring them up. So one point was that um, there's a guy called Elijah McCoy. So people don't understand the real McCoy came from this guy's name, which is a black man who created a lubricant oil, which is used for Americans' trains. So as the train would travel along the track, it would get hot with the metals touching. So this oil was allowed, which made a good lubricant and which made heat not to exchange from hot to the other. So the American people turned around and said, we need that original oil, the, the Elijah McCoy, the original McCoy oil. So that's where the saying came from. So to be the original McCoy, I've always said to myself that I must be black and I must be true to myself, which is the original McCoy, which is the original version of Mr. London Plumber. I mean, look, I cannot emphasize enough i know i told you this a long time about how much of an impact you inspire me mm -hmm. uh there's a few bits of pieces i've done at home because i think i'm a handyman i think i'm quite good with my hand there's been on four occasions i actually referred to your instagram page yeah because i said oh, oh you done I've done. and you've inspired me but beyond that you make plumbing cool and it is cool and a lot of people don't understand because we've got this notion nowadays where go to school, go to college, go to university, become some sort of big time, a lawyer, doctor, whatever, whatever. It's, we're so slowly shifting. Now mm -hmm. we don't do social media, play football, but there's something about trades work, like a real trades job. And I could be wrong. I just feel the level of interest from a young up and coming generation is becoming less and less and less. Mm. But when we see the likes of you make it cool, the money you make as well, we definitely can see that it's value, it's needed. So I think you're playing a very big part in keeping that trade alive to the young people. Because not everyone is academically inclined. Not everyone enjoys reading. Not everyone enjoys numbers. But some people are super good with their hands. I think there was there's 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 pinnacle times in in life where history plays a role, yeah. And whether it's some of us talking about what we need to do as our next steps or aligning ourselves in those next steps, I definitely took an idea when Damon Dash had that interview. If he ever wants to give me one, just shout me. Um, <laughs> when he said about owning your own business, yeah and being a boss. You're not a boss if you can't put someone on. And this whole younger generation, we all would like to be bosses, but wearing the boss hat doesn't fit in everybody's head. Mm -hmm. And to do business, you have to wear loads of different hats. 
right? So where people can't excel in those points is when they don't wear the hats when they're not good at. Like, I'm going to wear the hat of being able to conduct myself or I'm going to be wearing the hat of the social person of my business because I'm the face of it. I'm also going to be the hat of the person who is the technical side of it because I am a teacher. I'm also going to be the hat of person who works with the community because I grew up in communities like Tottenham. That's where I went to school. A lot of culture around there. I grew up around places not too far from Northwest London. So seeing that culture and understanding that my culture or my community and serving them has a bigger purpose than anything that I'm doing. Because I understand that people will see me, stop me on the street and say, why I watch your videos, you know? I've had a man do that to me. And you know what? If I have a hundred views on the video and that one person stops me, and that's more than what it's meant to do. And as long as people still talk about it, they're going to talk it to existence. And just being able to tap into that side of what someone else will need, whether it's not today, whether it's tomorrow, they're going to need it. That's solely important. And that brings so much joy to me. It's just like the same joy when I'm in a classroom and I teach somebody something who has no clue about how to bend the pipe. Right, they're going to do it now. And they're at this point, and I've been through it with loads of students, which are, they're sitting there and they're like, sir, man, I want to hug you, you know? Sir, can I, is that okay? Like, can I, can I do that, yeah? And I'm like, yeah, man, it's cool. it's cool. But that feeling is like the feeling when a customer pays me that extra couple of grand, whatever, you know, that little five grand, that little cheeky little, oh, I've got that money for you, Jay. Oh, thanks, Stu. Like I'm going to smile to myself. He said five grand, ladies and gentlemen. He didn't say five pound tip, you know, <laughs> extra five grand. But I'm going to smile to myself, but yeah. I understand that feeling of giving that back to somebody is, is, is just, it's, um, it's a soul-pleasing feeling, yeah. you know. When, 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 I, when people uh, reach out to me and they say, do you know what, this has helped me, I can only say, look, I'm just here to help, man, because when other people, when I needed help, I had people to turn to. If we've all got someone to turn to for a bit of help, a bit of advice at some point in life, it's going to make things a lot smoother. It's going to make things a lot easier. You know, like some of us have had more experience dealing with high-end customers, high-end contracts. Like anytime I get business contracts and stuff like that, I sit and talk with my cousin about it because my cousin's worked with Facebook. He's worked with YouTube. My cousin actually designed for Rolls Royce. But my cousin's not a person like me where he cares about being out there. Yeah. But Julian is a great person. I have to big him up all the time because you know, he's a star. The way you big up um, your dad, your uncle, your sister, Julian, and the people, it's amazing. I mean, you're all about building. What advice would you give to any young person out there who's thinking mm. of taking the route you take and becoming a plumber? First of all, you have to ask yourself why you want to do it because the cliche things can't be the reasons why. We all like money. Of course we like money. But you could learn stocks and shares and make money very quickly. But this is a long-term thing and what it's going to create for you is a residual income but it's also a job where you physically have to be there until technology chooses to change it. So therefore your time is always going to be going up. My hourly rate might start at like, it started at like, let's say it started at 30 pounds an hour. It's now at 180, 200 pound an hour. So two hours on the job and another little cheeky job on the way home, we can go Selfridges. Do you get it? It's just a way of life if you want that type of life. Or you could work flat out. But the whole thing about it is, I'm trying to work smarter in life. So <clears throat> when you're getting into plumbing, you have to understand that you have to give yourself a level of um, commitment. You're going to have to commit to the course. You're going to have to commit your time. If you're not like that, or if that's not for you, or if you don't like getting your hands dirty, or if you don't think that you could do that, 
watch videos. I would always say videos and content to show you what a plumber does do because people actually don't know. Someone would say, oh, Jay, you're a plumber, but you touch pl toilets all day. Believe me, I fit five taps in one day and I charge £280 per tap. So there was no, there was no toilets involved, but if I do fit a toilet the next day, I might go on holiday because it's just extra money. <laughs> but what I'm saying to you is just that the, the, the skills, what you're going to require over the time, yeah, as a plumber, are going to help your family. Everyone's aunt needs a shower put in, a tap put in or something. For you to be helpful to your family, that's resourceful for you, for your whole family network, period. Being a handy person to be able to put up some fences or do something with tools. People are going to need you, yeah? So it's a skill you're going to get. It's a skill you're going to have to work hard at. It's a skill you're going to have to apply yourself. And you have to be a person who's willing to learn you're not going to get everything in one day. You're not going to be able to understand. I've had students who have been taught by other people for six months, don't know how to bend a pipe. Spend a week with me, I'll show you how to bend a pipe. But do you know what you won't do? You won't have any breaks. If you need to go to the toilet, you go to the toilet in your time. When you're in my class, we're working. No, don't be talking to your friend. Don't be getting out your phone. If it's nothing to do with what I'm talking about today, don't do it. Because guess what? You're wasting my time. My time doesn't need to be wasted and you haven't got any time to waste. Because when you try and explain to people about their education and when you're in this room, this is free for now. But I've worked at training centres. You might be on a plumbing course and you paid as an adult £7,000. You could pay up to £9,000 at one point. But someone else who's now under the age of 16 to let's say 19, you're going to get this course for free. But if you choose to not turn up and not choose to apply yourself, yeah, you will have nothing cut at the end of it. And at the end of it, it's never guaranteed a full-time job. You're guaranteed maybe an interview before somebody else because you've now got the qualifications, but you now need the experience. But if you conduct yourself in a way where people can see that you've got it in you or you want to do that, and you're actively looking for that every single day, every day you're not at college, you're actively looking for a job or you're actively looking for a job in construction, someone's gonna give you that chance. When someone gives you that chance, now you've got to prove yourself. Now you've got one step closer to being where you wanna be because getting that wage sorts out a little bit of life's problems, but you still gotta work. You still gotta gain more skills on top of that because if you've got the basic skills, you're now dealing with 3,000, or let's say there's 5,000 people that have that basic skill. To upskill your skills so you now go from getting 30 grand a year to 50 grand a year, you need to get some more skills, some more training. That might take you another two years a year, four years to master it. Now you've added on and now you've got 10 years of experience. Now you can now command a higher rate because of your experience and you could go to a job like I've been to jobs and I've just been able to look at them through my years of experience, say that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong as well. Wow. And that's what people are gonna pay you for, your experience. And I feel that when you can get in there and give your experience and people feel confident by that, they're gonna pay you what you want. They are, they're gonna, they're gonna be honest and be like, look, you've got a skill, we want to utilize that, but we understand that that cost, and that cost comes at this rate, so, you're able to dictate how much you would like, but you'll also be able to show people the value of what, what you hold in doing that. And I feel that that is more, people hold that more to heart when it comes to this business, is that I can spend an hour with this person, they're gonna charge me 150 pound, but the person who I've got in before, he was never gonna show me all these problems. Ladies and gentlemen, if a young man can fall in love with a job from the age of 13, moving on to the age of 15. As talented as gifted he is to the point where he went and represented the UK in judo, but yet still pursued his happiness in what he do. Built himself to charge whatever he wants to charge so he can live a comfortable life to do what he wants to do. Above all that, 
His also purpose is to give back to the community, help others to see people win just like him, to give back just like he was given back. Imagine what you could do with the time and resources. Yes, although the times have changed, it might take you five years as opposed to two years when he did it, but still you are gaining knowledge, improving your skill set, which in turn buy you freedom in time to come. Till next time, ladies and gentlemen, love, peace, and happiness. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to share, subscribe, comment, and all that good stuff. Yes. Thank you for Mr. London. Thank you. Jesus. Thank you.